All right, good morning, Internet. Uh, today I'm just going to go over kind of a, a neat little idea that I came across probably about two years ago when I was writing a, a well, what was supposed to be a small essay. It started growing and growing and growing, and now I'm kind of playing with the idea of making it a thesis. Uh, it was on basically classical ergonomics and body movement in, uh, in classical Japan, or at least classical Japanese martial arts, of course. Um, so what ended up happening was in most of my papers, I present the notion, uh, bring to the table some of the things that are going to be involved, and then one of the first things I do is break down the jargon by etymology. Um, now etymology is uh, a very heavily debated field in linguistics. Um, I'm not overly familiar with it in other languages, but I know in Japanese it's, the arguments go back and forth. So. Uh, what I'm going to present is a little bit of my own uh, studies, my own research, my own theories, and uh, and probably a little bit of opinion in there. Um, so in any case, yeah, the subjects uh, or the, the original paper looked at basically the model of of, uh, of ski or uh, striking and thrusting, uh, be it with a weapon or otherwise. Um, most people that follow me already know I look at uh, classical martial arts traditions in a very uh, uh, holistic fashion. So, uh, you know, in the case of, uh, of a punch, the method for, for punching is also the me uh, method for thrusting with a spear or a sword, uh, as it is the method for throwing uh, uh, some kind of small concealed blade. Um, so naturally a paper based around ergonomics was uh, going to look at some particular movements. In this case, uh, the ski. Now, uh, the ski, the thrust, is going to be, of course, um, delivered from some form of posture or kamae. Um, and so, in looking at the, the kanji for kamae, which looks a little something like this. Load pretty please. That's not the right program. Uh, looks a little something like this. Alright, so it's... Uh, it's seen a lot in classical martial arts and some modern martial arts. Uh, uh, due to the influence of uh, karate do uh, all over the place, uh, the tendency has been to lean towards uh, the use of the term uh, tachi or dachi, meaning stance. Whereas this, uh, according to Masaki Hatsumi of the Bujinkan, uh, is utilized and emphasized a little bit more uh, to avoid that kind of static idea of standing there in a fighting position. Uh, which in many cases, uh, classical and traditional fighting positions can be rather exhausting or fatiguing because of the low posture, the widespread legs, the, uh, so on and so forth. A certain tension that, that ends up being involved, uh, especially to those that aren't uh, expert in its performance. So this character ends up being used. Uh, in modern use, it also comes, uh, it's also followed by the hiragana character e, uh, to emphasize that kamai. Uh, but classically, like in the times when it predated um, the use of hiragana, especially widespread use of hiragana, uh, you'd see it as this. And you'd see, of course, another uh, kanji before or after it giving it a context. It's not just going to show up like that. Um, <clears throat> so in any case, naturally the, the punch is going to come from a fighting posture. So I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, well, what can we do? I dig through a couple of etymology dictionaries and I get an idea of what it's made up of. And uh, this is essentially what I found uh, and with some of my, my hypotheses uh, influencing it. So here we've got kamai. It means, uh, according to modern dictionaries, it basically means posture or attitude. Um, which suggests to me a connection between the physical and the mental or the sociological or even the spiritual. Um, we call this the, the psychophysical relationship or a, a little bit older term is uh, psychosomatics, basically how the mind and body interact, uh, the relationship between the mind and body. So that's Kamai. Uh, now it's made up of two characters. Uh, yeah, my mouse works here. It's made up of Moku and uh, this character here is also called Kamai. Um, now, we can push these back uh, further in history. Well, first, here's what Moku looks like alone. Ta-da! All right, and here's what Kamai looks, uh, looks alone. All right, so they're pretty straightforward characters.
all good, these are all opening up in multiples. So here, boom, right? Kamai, looks a lot like Kamai. Uh, I am looking off to the side because I'm using a second monitor here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that makes up those two characters. Now, um, if we push it back further, the character, oh, I can't see there. La. Here we go, Moku. Moku basically means tree or wood in Japanese. When you see three of these together in the same character, in the same bunching, it means forest. Um, <clears throat> so if we were to go really, really, really far back in history to uh, its older form called uh, the shell and bone script, I forget the Japanese and the Chinese for it for that matter. Um, so unfortunately we're gonna have to do without there. But, um, but the way it looks, um, in the shell and bones script is something like this. Um, yeah, all these are hand done. And my, my calligraphy is terrible. Um, well, this is obviously not calligraphy, this is really, really plain. But so this is uh, the oldest form of moku that we can find. Uh, and with shell and bone script, a little bit of a history lesson here. Basically, it's the use of Chinese characters in ancient China to communicate, send messages, or divine with, well, the divine, or, uh, yeah, so basically to, to protect or, or fortune tell the future, uh, send messages to deities or higher ups or what have you. Um, I'm not fully educated, well, fully, I'm not very educated in Chinese um, class, classical mythology and the idea of, uh, uh, or their interpretation of heaven and the divine and uh, and various deities. So I can't talk too much about that, but I do know it has been used as a form of uh, uh, divining the unknown, divining the mysterious. Um, so this would be written on shells or bones and they'd be thrown into a fire and, uh, and burnt. Uh, the cracks that develop in them is supposed to be the, the response from the, from the powers that be, the upper, the higher above. Um, heaven or what have you. Um, so this character, they'd, they'd write on shells and bones and burn it and, and therefore get their messages uh, to and from them above. Um, now, according to some etymology dictionaries, uh, and at least two professors I've come across now, they look at this and they say, okay, it looks like a tree. We've got the roots here. Uh, I should get a highlighter on my mouse. Uh, we've got the roots here and the branches here. So, the uh, if we were to look at it in the in the context of a posture, we've got roots that are spread out. Oh yeah, it emphasizes uh, an organic structure of of wood, right? Uh, the organic element uh, also being interpretable as flexible or mobile. So it's not just a stationary tree, but one that that moves and blows. Um, so the roots here imply a sort of organic support structure for the structure and of course the upper body uh, of the person. So it's like having the uh, the limbs or the legs spread to support uh, whatever the rest of the structure may be. So that's moku uh, in its shell and bone script. Uh, the other part, kamai, and it's, well, we don't have shell and bone script of this one. We do how, however have the ancient uh, seal script, what we'll see in uh, in people's personal seals and signatures and that looks like this right so that and that boom boom right so you can see the connection it's it hasn't evolved nearly as much as some other characters uh if i do more videos like this i'll show some that just changed dramatically but here we can see a connection between the two and the way it's read, yeah, so this is seal script. The way it's basically read and looked at is essentially it's a structure. It's a symmetrical structure, as you can see here. And, well, it's a little bit more curvy here, but here nonetheless. Uh, it's a symmetrical structure uh, that's level on both sides, which I kind of come to see this as uh, as like the, the shoulders and the hips, right, of the, of the human body. Uh, so it's level on both sides. It's symmetrical, and uh, and well, and that's essentially it. it's a symmetrical structure. That's how uh, how some of the dictionaries have described it. Now, 
uh, the in intricacy here that we see in, in both examples. I mean, it doesn't need all these crisscrosses. It'd be enough to have like a square with a couple lines or something, but no, it's it's complicated enough to infer um, some symbolism there. So some dictionaries have basically emphasized that it also means uh, the internal structure of something. So where you'd have a building uh, or a fortification, it's not only looking at the outsides, the walls, it's also looking at uh, the build on the inside, the intricacy, the hallways, the the internal walls, uh, and of course the feng shui on the inside. So in the context of the human posture and attitude, this could be looked at as the attitude, the deeper part of, uh, of the physical creature. So where we have uh, the symmetrical structure that's you know supported by organic mobile uh, supports, the legs, uh, it's also got a certain form to it. Uh, that's symmetrical and, and level. Uh, and then, of course, the inside element, the attitude, where uh, having a strong physical structure also supports the internal uh, mental structure, uh, which in turn supports all the elements of one's health, uh, one's emotions, their energy, um, and so on and so forth. Now, some of this terminology is also used in battlefield formations. Uh, <clears throat> Referring to the the posture or the formation of the uh, of the not the soldiers but the the units right the units and the overall strategy. So, um, so of course it goes on the small scale of the human being, but also the large scale of the whole army. Uh, and of course fortifications in their own right. And uh, Liu, uh they talk about that a little bit in their uh, Hei Ho. Uh, I forget the name of the scroll. Keiho Kaki, no, Kakyudan was, was uh, Taijutsu, I can't recall, but in any case, um, so what we end up having there is the original character, Kamai, being uh, a symmetrical structure, level on all sides, uh, with an internal complexity inferring its attitude, and of course it's made of an organic entity, a human being. Probably not. Probably less emphasis on wood, more emphasis on it being an organic entity. Um, so there you have it. There's a, a breakdown of of the Chinese character used in a Japanese context of kamai. Um, nowadays, it refers to uh, different fighting postures uh, in the martial arts. Anyways, it refers to fighting postures and and formations um, <clears throat> outside of. Outside of the martial arts context, it refers to many other things. Not the focus of my study, so I'm not going to open my mouth on that because, simply put, not too sure. Right? So that's pretty much uh, the gist of that idea. Um, I hope that was interesting. And uh, I have a dozen windows open. Boom, boom, boom. All right. So I hope that was interesting. Uh, and I hope that kind of gives a little bit of a gateway or maybe uh, a lead in, some leads for uh, further meditation or, or ideas. Uh, uh, so as I personally interpret the term Kamai, uh, depending on its context, how I would translate it, it would be something like a, a psychophysical relationship. The, the psycho, the, the um, psychological and the physical, psychophysical. Uh, relationship, so the interaction between the mind and body, which of course, to be a truly effective machine, you have to have these two things working together quite nicely, hence the practice of Kamai as a practice in its own right, as opposed to just a fighting posture. Um, so yeah, psychosomatics or the psychophysical relationship, the psychophysical posture. All right, there you have it.